We're rolling. You must be kidding me. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Boot to the head. And Rish Outfield. Ow, you put it in the head! Come one, come all, to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 91. 91? Yes. Cool. Well, that would make me Rish Outfield then. And I would be Big Anklevich. Welcome, folks. <laughs> Welcome back. Us. <laughs> it's it's been... funny. I looked at the file today. We recorded our last episode November 15th. Ooh, bye. I know, that's, cr- that's more than two months, right? Something like that, anyway. Almost two months. Okay, so pretend I didn't say that. It was just <laughs> last week we recorded it. This is very fresh. So that would make this episode The Invisible Kingdom. That's right, by Mark L. S. Stone. No, seriously. Come on. You just, <laughs> you just made that up. There ain't no writer like that. You and that no seriously joke. It's getting to be as commonly used as the, hey, that's our show, folks. And then the music starts up. Oh, there it is. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I was, he, he, uh, okay, good night, folks. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that story. Okay, so, yes, today's story, Invisible Kingdom by Mark L. S. Stone. Have we started again? <laughs> Have you ever known somebody that has two middle names? No, I don't think so. I've known one guy who had both Carl and William were his middle names. Well, how do they... I don't want to say justify because our author has that, but well, how do they explain that away? Or how do they... Okay, ju- how do they justify two middle names? Well, I think our author actually doesn't have two middle names. I think when he got married, he decided to inherit his wife's name as well as keeping his own name. I think that's how that worked out. But I don't know how they justify it. I think it's just they want to be cool, you know, and have an extra name. And then maybe they just liked so many names and they weren't able to decide on just two. And so they went with the third one, too. Oh, I have so many names. All right. Well, I'm sure we have offended and ostracized another author in saying this. <laughs> Let's start the story and find out what he says. Let's do that. By day, wait, we'll have... About the author. Thank you. By day, Mark L. S. Stone is a middle school science teacher in Oakland, California. By night, Mark L. S. Stone is a middle school science teacher in Oakland, California, because let's face it, these uh, exit slips and do nows and tests and lab reports aren't going to grade themselves. By weekend, Mm. Mark L. S. Stone is a fantasist. Yes, that's right. He lives in San Francisco with his wife, Abigail. He owns no cat. Yes! Favorite author ever. Take that, Mike Stone. (laughs) Yeah, Mark L. S. Stone is our new favorite stone. He does care for two turtles, many fish, and a snake. Definitely a man after your own heart. Yeah. I don't think he's ever microwaved any of his turtles. So. Oh. He blogs. It's an accident. <laughs> he blogs irregularly at burningzeppelinexperience.blogspot.com. This is his first sale. We'd like to thank R.E. Chambliss. To Renee, to you and me. Ken Crawford. Andy Kerr. Lynn Boyd. And Clay Duggar for lending their voices to today's episode. And we'd also like to give a big shout out of thanks to Clay Duggar for producing today's episode for us. Yeah, well, who did the sound effects? There were some sound effects from freesound.org. Okay. And the music was by permission of Dan O. And you can find links to all these things in the show notes. Enjoy! The Invisible Kingdom by Mark L. S. Stone Master! The dirty little man shouted, throwing himself on the ground at my feet. Tell me, please, when will you return to us? 
When will you take up the unseen crown and the loosened blade? When will you return in triumph to the invisible kingdom? I swear I could hear the capital letters. I said the only reasonable thing I could say under the circumstances, which was... Uh... What? The invisible kingdom, the man replied patiently. The mists of the chasm have clouded your thoughts, but you are the uncrowned king of the invisible kingdom, bearer of the loosened blade, magister of the verdant flame. During this little speech, I got a good look at the guy. He was dirty. No, not quite like a homeless person, more like someone who thinks he has bigger things on his mind than basic hygiene. You know what I mean. A little ripe, a little dusty, stained clothing, eyeglasses held together with tape. Oh, he was small, too. Skinny and only about five feet tall. His eyes? I can't really describe them. There was something about his eyes that didn't match the rest of him. They were sharp and clear, but also distant, unworldly. Maybe otherworldly is a better word. He was sad, hopeful, and intense, but he didn't look crazy. I'm sorry, I said, pushing past him. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. He called but something what about after the me. Prince something of doors about the Prince and the of Pact Doors of and the, the Pact Falls. of the Silent Falls. But I was already thinking about other things. Seriously, how long could I be expected to dwell on the ranting of one obviously crazy bum who had accosted me on the street? It was an isolated incident, a random occurrence. It could have happened to anyone, and it probably wasn't going to happen to me again. I'm an ordinary guy. I have an ordinary life. I work at the Barnes & Noble. I like Asian food and books and football. And I once tried pot in college. I have friends who care about me and a girlfriend who loves me. My life doesn't just turn itself upside down like this for no good reason. Was I ever wrong? It happened again the next day. I was on the train, and the guy next to me, a respectable-looking, balding, blue-suited businessman with a bit of a potbelly to him, put down his pen in the newspaper, he had been playing Sudoku, looked at me, and said, Good morning, my lord. I popped one of my headphones out of my ear and turned to face him. Excuse me? I couldn't help but notice you, master. Your radiance fills the compartment. You are the as-yet-uncrowned king, guardian of the ineffable gate... Lord of the Invisible Kingdom. He inclined his head, a jaunty little half-bow, but his eyes were serious and hopeful. You know, Master, if I may be so bold as to advise one such as yourself, this might be a good year to claim your throne, so to speak, make the unseen seen, the invisible visible, open the gates, reveal the secret fire, take up your crown and your blade... Return in triumph to the invisible kingdom, and so on. He leaned in close and winked at me. We have seen certain signs. In the shining mirror and the pool of mist, this will be a very good year. I stared at him in abject shock for a long moment. But who are you people? I finally sputtered. What the hell are you going on about? Ah, the guy said sadly. The chasm. I should have known. I will do my best to explain, Master. We are your humble servants, the surviving exiles of the Invisible Kingdom. You are our master, the uncrowned king, bearer of the lucent blade, and owner of a great many other titles besides. We await your glorious return and strive to hasten it. What does someone say to that? Fortunately, I didn't have to figure it out, because that was when the train stopped. I grabbed my stuff and ran for it. I didn't look, but I could feel his sad eyes burning holes in my back as I fled. From there, it got worse. I would run into two or three of these guys every day. The crazy people were everywhere. On the bus, on the train, on the streets, calling my cell phone, coming up to me at work. They came in all shapes and sizes, too. A little girl gave me a flower and asked when I was going to... Open the way to the invisible city and lead us home again. While two adults I took to be her parents looked on and beamed. There was a tall, skinny teenager working the counter at Quiznos who gave me my sandwich for free, saying, Anything for the uncrowned king. Just open the gates before my bitch of a landlord raises my rent on me again. One woman started hitting on me at the local cafe, but it turned out that she was just... 
aching for the touch of the Master, the one true Lord of the unnamed star, if it would not be too presumptuous to beg for such attention. Every time it happened, I did the same thing. I watched and listened, and as soon as I found an opening, I ran for it. I just kept hoping it would stop, and sometimes it would, but only for a little while. The lulls were just teases. After a day or two of peace, it would start up again, worse than before. My friends started to notice, especially my girlfriend Natalie, but that only made things worse. They kept on trying to drag me out of my apartment, get me to go out and do things, but my apartment was safe, and the trouble with going out was that it involved going out. Out was where the crazy people lived. My friends are persistent, so I kept on going out, and it kept on happening. It was on one such doomed outing that things finally hit a breaking point. I was out with my girlfriend at an Indian restaurant. Nothing crazy had happened so far, and thanks to that, and a few glasses of wine, I was finally beginning to relax. We were about to leave for the evening, and while I was handling the check, Natalie had to run to the bathroom. For the first time in a long while, the crazy people following me around were not the first thing on my mind. Natalie came back, after longer than I'd expected her to take, with a red splotch on her face and a hurt and confused look in her eyes. I jumped up, put my arms around her and said, Nat, what's wrong? This, this bitch, she hit me, she said. I was waiting for the ladies' room, and when the line was down to just her and me, she turned around and said, It's your fault he won't return to us. The Invisible Kingdom's misery is on your head. You're the one who's stolen the Master's heart. And then she hit me, just like that, and ran off while I was still stunned. I helped her wrap some ice in a napkin so she could keep the swelling down. What did she look like? She was tall and thin, dark hair and a big frizzy ponytail. She had a strange look in her eyes. I think something was wrong with her. I went cold, and it wasn't the ice. Natalie, take a cab home. Ask the cabbie if he's ever heard of the Invisible Kingdom. And if he acts like he knows what you're talking about, take a different cab. Ben, what's going on? I don't know. Did you know this woman? No, I insisted. I had no idea how to explain what was going on without sounding like some kind of paranoid. Natalie is a psychology student, and she's always diagnosing people with mental disorders. The last thing I need is for her to decide I'm crazy. I don't know what's going on. It's just some people out to harass me. I don't know. You have to go home, Nat. What are you going to do? I'm... I'm going to call the cops, I lied. I'd tried that already. The police officer I spoke to had listened patiently and then said, You can't blame them, really, Master. They just want to go home. I didn't know what I was going to do, but it wasn't going to involve running away. Once I'd gotten rid of Natalie, I stalked through the restaurant, looking for some crazy person. I had a clear mental image of grabbing some guy by the lapels and throwing him up against the wall. I wouldn't demand to know what was going on. I was past that. I'd just make sure he understood that it was going to stop. Just my luck. For the first time in weeks, there weren't any around. All I saw was a restaurant full of diners, peering at the angry young man stalking around with murder in his eyes. Eventually, the hostess asked me to leave, saying I was disturbing the other customers and gently implying that I was drunk and might want to sleep it off. I found what I was looking for at my apartment, of all places. It was the first crazy person I had ever met, the small, dirty man who had started this whole thing. He was standing in my living room. Pretty much everything I owned, CDs, books, my laptop, was in a pile in front of him. And in his hand was a stick, and the stick was on fire. He held his torch high over his head, leaving a scorched spot on the ceiling. I was standing by the open door, jacket in one hand, key in the other. I must have looked like an idiot. I understand, he shouted. I have found the way. The mists of the chasm can only be cleared by fire. Fire! The fire of the verdant brand. I will burn away the trappings of this world and free the uncrowned king to return to the invisible kingdom. The exiles will hail me as their hero, and you will thank me. He lifted his torch even higher and made to throw. Stop! I shouted suddenly. To my surprise, he did. He looked at me expectantly. 
Uh, um, I stammered. Don't you, uh, uh, don't you understand anything? What do you mean? If you employ the verdant flame before the time is right, it will ruin everything. I was thinking fast, pretty much saying the words as they came into my head. It was complete bullshit, but it seemed to slow him down. Master? Have you returned to us? His voice trembled with emotion. Has the verdant flame removed the mists of the chasm from before your imperishable sight? Only for a time. Uh, Listen, I must be brief. Uh, If the mists of the chasm are cleared away before it is time, then the invisible kingdom will be lost to the exiles forever. None of you will return home. But master, then how? When the time is right, you will know it by the signs. The shining mirror and the pool of mist speak truly, but they alone are not enough. The laughing stone will throw off its silence, and the sounds of mirth will fill the hall of voices once more. The circle of trees on the stargazing hill, uh, the oak, the ash, uh, and the rowan will put forth first flowers and, and then fruit. The second star will rise along with the first, and the celestial music will be heard from every shadow in the forest of night. The invisible kingdom is, is, is yet too far from this world for methods as crude as yours to be effective. You must have patience. The guy looked at me, stunned, and then dropped to his knees, letting his torch fall to the ground. I stamped it out while he groveled. Yes, master, of course. It will be as you say. We will await your triumphant return. Go, but be before the smoke of the verdant brand leaves me and the mists of the chasm return. Yes, master, of course. He scrambled through the door, then turned in the hallway to look at me one last time. The invisible kingdom yet lives, he declared in awe, then scurried away. I sat on my couch with a <sighs> sigh. Over the next few days, things got better. The crazy people stopped bothering me, and every time I saw one of them... I just uttered a little more bullshit about shining this and invisible that and unknowable other things, and they left me alone. Natalie eventually forgot about the incident in the restaurant and never implied that there was anything wrong with me. My friends thought it was odd that I had started carrying a thesaurus around and flipping through it when there was nothing better to do, looking for newer and more obscure words to use on the crazies. But that was it. My life was finally getting back to normal. And then... The other day, Natalie and I were watching movies in her apartment, mine still reeked of smoke, when she suddenly turned to me and said, You know, Ben, I've been thinking. Oh, I replied. Yes, she said. I've been thinking it really is time. I felt my heart beat a little faster. Time for what? She touched the side of my face and turned my head so I could look into her eyes. Her eyes were shining with tears and full of love, sad and intense at the same time, and not even a little bit crazy. She kissed me and then said, It's time for you to take up your crown, Ben, and return to the Invisible Kingdom. It's time to go home. And now, a word about today's story. Hi, my name is Mark L. S. Stone, author of The Invisible Kingdom. This story wasn't written with any particular themes in mind. It just kind of fell out of my head, all at once. In retrospect, though, I can see what I was trying to get at, even though I didn't know it. I wrote The Invisible Kingdom at a pretty miserable period of my life. I had graduated from college only to be rejected from grad school. I was lost and confused, and I was working in a bookstore. The only good thing about life was coming home to my then-girlfriend, later fiancé, and now wife. Hi, Abby. I think The Invisible Kingdom is about adulthood, which seemed at the time like a vast and mysterious country of unknowable rules, obscure responsibilities, and impossible demands. Things are a lot better now. I have a new career path, I'm married, and I think I'm finally getting the hand of this whole adulthood thing. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed my story. If you want to hear more about my work, uh, or my other thoughts on writing, role-playing, and my other interests, come visit me at BernieXZeppelinExperience.blogspot.com. And now, a word from our sponsors. 
This holiday season, the creators of Barbie Nutcracker, Barbie Seven Dancing Princesses, Barbie Swan Lake, and Barbie Single White Female bring you... I believe in toy sales. Uh, I work hard stocking shelves, organizing by color, brand, age, appropriateness. Uh, but the chain stores, they undersell me. They keep my inventory for themselves. And the scalpers come first thing in the morning and they clear me out. And minority children are leaving my store looking like an inner city Kmart. You come to me on the day of my sister Skipper's wedding and say, help me, Barbie. But you've never respected me. You've never honored me. You don't even have the decency to call me doll father. If you'd been my friend from the start, then the children who ruined your toy section would be suffering even now. Dollfather, be my friend? Barbie Dollfather, we're not even trying anymore. <laughs> Okay, welcome back, folks. Did you enjoy? No? Yes? Please? Wait, but you said enjoy after the story was done. (laughs) No, I said it before, and then I said it again after. Oh, so we give all these credits before the story runs? Yeah, we always say who lended their voice to the episode. I just usually do it after you've sent it to me because I never know until it's too late. Well, in this one, he totally took this off our hands. Yeah. He volunteered to produce the story, and then he cast it, sent us an email and said, you know, Rish, you be the main guy. Big, I want you to be the crazy guy. He assigned parts to other people and got people to do them themselves. And that was the last I ever heard until it was done. Yeah. Which was neat. I I guess that's what it's like when we ask other people to work for us. But yeah, Duggar pulled it off. We can talk about the story, but the first thing I want to ask, though, is how fun was it? to do the voice of the crazy guy (laughs) you know i was listening to it after it came back to us and i was thinking man i really like it but i should have taken it another notch i should have taken it up another level and just been that much more out of control i should have robin williams that whole part and oh it's a beautiful thing (laughs) it was fun though i I enjoyed being (laughs) master i especially like the second time when i come back and I'm really getting into it, and I'm, I'm going to save the Invisible King. Would he be the Invisible King if he's the King of the Invisible Kingdom? I believe I'm bearer of the Verdant Crown or something like that. <laughs> I think you're the Verdant Brand? Holder of the... Lucent Blade. You are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't think the character even had a name until the very end. <laughs> it was just I until the girlfriend said his name. Well, you could have been the Dirty Little Man, which was my character's uh, name as far as that went. So, you know. It's typecasting. (laughs) Today we were talking about Joe Pantoliano and how he always gets cast as like a scumbag and a dirty slob type person. You know, that would be me. Wait, that would be me. Right. I was a dirty little man. (laughs) So, okay. So suddenly they cast Joe Pantoliano as Galadriel's husband in The Hobbit or something. (laughs) You're just like, wow, he married up? (laughs) (laughs) I got to do that sometimes. I mean, someday, you know, Steve Buscemi is going to get that role that he's been waiting for where he's like the hero. Steve Buscemi Buscemi. and And Megan Megan Fox Fox in (laughs) the love story story of the year. And you're like, wow. (laughs) Wow. I wonder if she can act in this one. So, <laughs> But it's after he's gotten his teeth done like that one freaking American Idol guy did. I don't remember what his name was, but he had the foobar teeth. Oh, you know. And his name all was. the dentists like said, hey, I'll do your teeth for free. And I'll do your sister for a very small fee. Wait. Don't go there. Uh, uh, that oh, was, you had to uh, go there. Mildly offensive guest star uh, came in. <laughs> I, I, he just... Sorry. I uh, think we ought to bring back the hate letter of the week. Okay, so I read this story at Comic-Con last July. That's how long ago <laughs> he sent this story. It, it filtered through. Uh, I don't know. Had you already read it by then? Or? I had, yes. I, I forwarded it on to you because I, I enjoyed the story and I wanted you to give it a chance. And I remember where I was. I had gone to a Taco Bell that was just across the street from my motel room and I 
brought the printout that you'd given me and I was, and, uh, you know, the, the listener, if you're a new listener to the show, you may not know that no woman will sleep with me. Oh, okay. Uh, and to ensure that that remains the case, I sometimes read these stories doing the character voices aloud. In Taco Bells. Yes, well, and I certainly did in this Taco Bell uh, until they asked me to leave. But They're scaring the customers. It, uh, And this is going to sound like a backhanded compliment, so don't take it the wrong way. It's kind of a silly story. It doesn't make any friggin' sense <laughs> at all. But it was just so fun. That I was like, I don't care. I want to do this on the show just to be able to do the the, the, the lines. You know, that stuff that you got to do uh -huh. was the best part, despite all the looks from Taco Bell customers. <laughs> and and so in, in, in my original idea, my concept for it, I was going to have like all the people from the Invisible Kingdom have some kind of accent, some kind of – and it wouldn't just be like English accent, which is the norm, but come up with some way of talking that kind of, designates – Kind of like an Australian Canadian accent? Well, OK. Yes. But they all have the same way of speaking. And I was just like, oh, you know, how much fun this will be. And we'll have like, you know, OK, you go up on this word that you would never, ever go up on and stuff like that. And, but then at the end of the story, the girlfriend is revealed to be one of them. And I thought, oh, shoot, well, either she's always spoken oddly or she takes this moment to suddenly start speaking oddly, which makes even less sense than the actual story. Uh, I think they're all just going to have to speak Americanese. Americanese? Are we talking Star Wars again? You know, it was a, it's, a, it's an interesting story. It doesn't make sense conventionally. And I think that may be part of it. It's kind of like a horror story when it comes down to it. It may be silly and strange but similar to like the metamorphosis or the trial some kind of a kafka-esque experience i think um, big is right where this guy is just a normal guy he works at the barnes and noble he tried pot in high school or college or whatever it was third grade okay third grade like the rest of us and uh all of a sudden everything's turned on its head all these people around him have decided he's this king that they've all been waiting for and they accost him everywhere he goes and there's no way around it and then they beat his girlfriend in the bathroom and it just keeps getting worse and worse until he thinks he's got it in hand and then suddenly even the person that it's closest to him is and have these people been that way all along or did the verdant brand suddenly clear the mists of the chasm away for them so that now his girlfriend remembers that oh yes she is from the invisible kingdom or is it something else is well it, it could be that the essence of these in invisible kingdomers have entered into just everyday new yorkers or something uh -huh. like that and one of them got into oh, his there girlfriend there you know taking her over uh, or using her as a mouthpiece for for one of his followers I don't know. And that's part of what's kind of fun about the story is maybe if it did explain, it would be one of those where you're like, ah, oh, you know, I liked it better before you told us what was going on. Uh, to me, this feels like it would make a, a really fun Twilight Zone episode, one of the, the sillier Twilight Zone episodes. And, and there were some lighter ones that nobody ever really remembers, but uh -huh. like the one with Dick York where he... Uh, His he, wife is a witch and... Just wiggles her nose and like weird crap happens. And he's replaced by Dick Sargent and nobody notices. Nobody says anything. And they're like, wait, same first name, not same last. These guys aren't even brothers. But they are dicks. Um, no, there's this one where he, he's buying a newspaper and he throws his coin into the box and it lands on its side. And the guy's like, wow, hey, mister. And for the rest of the day, he's able to read people's thoughts. And it's the episode, of course, Penny for Your Thoughts. Oh. Uh, until somebody throws a coin in and it knocks that one on its side over. And that's the only explanation for why this works. <laughs> but it's a very comedic episode. It's not, you know, some awful murder plot. You right. Know, it's like that, like that. Uh, Mel Gibson movie where he can hear people's thoughts and it's all, what is that, what a, what a girl wants? Oh, geez, what women want. I'd completely forgotten that. And he keeps hearing them think like, oh, look at his butt. It's nice. Oh, I'd like to get a piece of that action or something like that. It's never what women really think. I really <laughs> liked that movie. But I, I felt like it went to a dark place at the end and, and it caught me off guard. 
But then again, you know, I, I enjoyed the movie and, and maybe it's not PC to say that you did anymore. <laughs> like, I never loved those Lethal Weapon movies. Never. That's right. I, I don't know. It, it just, it, the story is short, to the point, and uh, it resolves itself with, you know, the classic, oh, yeah, it, it, so it would just be perfect. <laughs> I, it just makes me want to imagine in my head what happens next. What does this guy do? Does he finally say, oh, okay, lead me to the invisible kingdom to these people? What does he do next? Where it's does he go? It's just a sex metaphor, isn't it? Maybe it is. is. I think it's time. You guys are pitiful. It's time, honey. I've been a virgin for way too long. There's something creepy about you, Big Anklevich. Okay. Uh, that, was, that was an okay joke. Sure, just dig yourself in deeper. I guess if we really want to look into it, and probably the story doesn't need intense analysis, you either thought it was fun, or if you didn't, then you're at the wrong podcast. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, remember Good Day by Saul Lemerod? I do remember where that. Where that one was just so absurd and much, much sicker than Invisible Kingdom. Yes, yes. But it's one of those where it's like, you know what? The rules that guide our everyday lives do not apply in this story, in this world. Uh -huh. And yeah, this is sort of the same thing. You know, the world has gone crazy, and maybe... Being sane is, is the crazy thing to do. Obviously, this guy is the heir to some throne, and there is some kind of veil across his eyes. Yeah, it's a shining this and a effervescent effervescent throne, maybe. That's a good word, right? Put the thesaurus away. Aww. I, I'm trying to think of a superhero scenario or something like this where people keep coming to this person and saying, you're supposed to be our, you know, our, our leader or our savior or our, our, our Keanu Reeves. And he's like, no, I, I'm not any of those things. Well, isn't that the thing that the uh, hero's journey has to have? The refusal, of the, the, refusal the of the call of duty. He always has to say, oh, no, i got to stay home with Aunt Beru and Uncle Owen and mine the moisture. And the blue milk. I need to farm some more moisture first. Hey, have any of you listeners, do any of you have the version where Beru is British? Uh, I do. He's just not a farmer, Owen. You know, or whatever. And it's like, whoa, what the crap? Because uh, I guess the actress actually was English. Yeah, and they did one of those. And they dubbed her dub over like they did with lots and lots Wouldn't of you say seventy percent of the characters in <laughs> yeah. Star Wars were dubbed over? Interesting that. <clears throat> Anyhow, are we talking Star Wars again? Of course, announcer man every week. So hey, here's a question for you. Now that you bring up superhero metaphors, there's that new show coming out. I think it starts like now. Probably by the time the episode's out was canceled. Yeah, there you go. It's got. I think it's got River Tam in it. Um, it's called The Cape. Do you know what the deal is with that show or anything about it, really? Is it? Yeah, it's a, a, a guy whose son idolizes this superhero, the comic character, you know, called the Kate. Uh -huh. And then he ends up being framed for a crime he didn't commit. And he goes on the lam and takes on the identity of his son's favorite superhero, fictional superhero, mm -hmm. to, like, put things right in this really corrupt city. That, that's what I believe I've not seen it or anything like that. Well, I'm sure for you even to know River Tam is in it, I, you have to have seen something. I know absolutely nothing. That's why I ask you about it. I saw a commercial or two for it, and it made it seem like, and I was thinking, that might be an interesting idea, just a superhero story, which they've never done much of. I mean, Batman doesn't have superpowers, but just a kind of a story set present day of people who've had enough. And so they, because see, I was watching the news once, and I saw a story about a bunch of comic book nerd guys and they got laid they no it was, it was not quite that fantastic oh okay these guys just decided that they wanted to try and i don't know how they they are actually stopping crime by doing this but they decided that they were going to be superheroes so they made themselves up superhero outfits and then they would go out together and just walk around the mean streets. They would go out there and walk around so that at night so that there would be somebody out there watching so that the criminals couldn't do their thing. So they're basically a neighborhood watch in costumes. But I was just thinking if you took that a level further, just some normal guys that are not normal guys. Uh, maybe that's the wrong word. So <laughs> people from the modern world that decide that, you know, they're going to do something about it. And instead of just walking around, they actually do something be interesting to uh, watch so i wonder maybe this cape show might be worth checking out 
Well, you, you did you not see Kick Ass? No, I didn't. Is that? That's sort of like that, where a teenage kid says, "You know, I'm, I've read all these comic books. I'm going to go out and be a superhero." And he is beaten rather brutally. Nice. It's a really good movie. Hit Girl is rad. Really, she's. <laughs> I, I want an action figure of Hit Girl, but. So it's like you and I talked about watching that together one time, and it didn't happen. Oh, we should. I'd be totally down with watching that. But, uh, yeah, he gets beaten horribly, horribly bad, and I guess he suffers some kind of nerve damage from these assholes beating the crap out of him, and he's unable to feel pain. And so he, as soon as he's recovered, he goes out and he does it again. And this time, you know, somebody punches him, and it doesn't matter. And, uh, so he actually becomes he's this superhero. Yeah, and uh, I, I don't know. It's 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 kind of a parody of superhero movies, and it's also set in a world where they have comic books and a comic book store, and you know are aware of superheroes as a fictional thing, right? Which doesn't seem to happen very often in the yeah. Comic Usually, books. there's yeah nobody's ever thought of that idea for some reason in the universe where there are real comic book heroes yeah it's it's funny you talk about hit girl being rad um oh shoot dude she's so rad the uh, i told you that when chloe moritz came out at comic-con people cheered harder nuts. for her than they had for like real movie stars and stuff because it's just like wow we feel like she is our you know somebody that only we know about kind of thing right. yeah it was funny one of those uh our valued customers thing <laughs> some dude is like Oh, that hit girl chick. She's so hot. They should have one of those countdown to 18. Because when she hits 18, I want to be first in line for a piece of that. <laughs> it's just like, oh. See, I thought we had this conversation. She was 14, I think, at Comic-Con. And she was you know, like 12 Maybe. and a half when she made the movie. Uh -huh. But she came out oh, and she had makeup up. on her uh -huh. eyes and her cheeks and her lips. And... I talked to somebody about it, and it might have been you, yeah. who said, that's perfectly fine. And I was like, dude, no. She looked like a tart. Well, yeah, I didn't and see And she's her just a little girl. Me, I can and, say whether it's perfectly fine like, or not. And he's like, no, nope, you are in the wrong. <laughs> and he's like, and damn you for judging her. And I, I said, no, 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 you don't understand. She's a really pretty little girl. Let her be a little girl. You know what I mean? It's just like, she's like, okay, I'm 14. And, and you know what? I don't know. Maybe she was only 13. And she's like, I'm going to go out and get breast implants because I want to be a grown-up <laughs> kind of thing. And you're like, no, be a girl. Be be young. Have fun. You know? It just Yeah. So that was you that put me in my place? That's right. Yeah. I said that at 14, girls have a tendency to start wearing makeup. Well, I'll tell you what. If you want to TiVo that show, I'll watch it with you or at least watch the pilot with you okay we had to check it out but i when i we're done in between shows make sure we don't miss it because i think the premiere is very soon okay and you know if if it's really good then we can talk about it on the show and see if we can get other people to watch it too but oh, hell no, you know if it, it. Well, big wasn't even talking where did he go <laughs> he just drops in like <laughs> spider-man and he's out again hey, let's talk about the new spider-man do you know who andrew garfield is yet I don't think so. Have you even seen pictures of him? You know, I probably have, but it's been long enough that no, I don't anymore. Okay, well, the thing about him that I love and seems to piss other people off, but you know what? F him. Is that this is a skinny guy. Uh -huh. He's not intimidating. Uh -huh. He's a kind of a gawky, geeky kid. You know, he's not, uh, he's not DJ Qualls, <laughs> but he's... He's a good Peter Parker. He's the last guy you'd suspect of being a guy who can tip over a car, you know? Right. And he's kind of got big eyes and you see he's a really decent kid, at least in uh, the social network, which is the only thing I know him from. And, you know, he's emotional. I was just like, wow. I, it was like the geek equivalent to seeing like a girl in a movie and you're like, oh, I've got a new favorite girl. Where I was just like, oh, this is, th oh, I embrace your, this. It's your new favorite geek. As Peter Parker, as I never embraced Tobey Maguire. Uh huh. My first exposure to Tobey Maguire as Spider Man was on the effing set. And uh, we exchanged like three words. And I was like, oh, he's playing my idol <laughs> since I was five years old. And he was kind of a dick to me. <laughs> 
I don't know that I've, uh, you know, like I've said on the air before, I've never really embraced Tobey Maguire as Peter Parker. He was Tobey Maguire before. Right. He was the Cider House Rules kid or, or something else before he was Peter Parker. But this Andrew Garfield thing, the first time I saw him, he was already cast as Peter Parker. And I'm able to just embrace this guy and say, oh, that's that's Peter Parker. And But people are, are all saying, you know, oh, he's too thin. You know, he's not muscular. He's not butch enough or whatever to be Spider-Man. And I'm just like, well, obviously you guys know nothing yeah. about Spider-Man. Spider-Man Spider should look ridiculous next to Captain America or next to the Hulk or next to Wolverine or, you know, even next to like the Punisher or some regular guy. He is the geekiest of all the superheroes, the spindliest, and he's never been drawn as some big hulking right. muscular brute. And that's one of the things that made him so unique as a superhero is, you know, the, the, the picked on puny Parker right. and all that stuff. They still called him puny Parker when he was Spider-Man, not knowing that he was Spider-Man kind of thing. And, and anyhow, I just, I, I could be wrong. This movie could totally blow, but I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt, which I'm sure as hell not willing to do with X-Men first class or, well, there have been others where it's like, you know what? You lost me already long gone. And you know what? It would be great if I go see X-Men First Class and because my expectations are super low, it's really cool. Yeah. I, it's I, always good to expect crap because then sometimes you don't get crap and you're surprised pleasantly. But one thing that is interesting about X-Men First Class versus all the other superhero films that are coming out in the summer, we've seen nothing for it. Yeah. Like, like two stills and that's it. There's not been a trailer. There haven't been posters all over the place. We've not seen any of the people in their costumes, really, as far as I know, if there are costumes. And so, you know, they're keeping that hush, hush, either to be a surprise or because... They got nothing? Uh, the comic book geeks are the pickiest, whiniest, loudest, I think, of all the geeks. Yeah? You know, you don't put wings on Captain America's mask and you're a friggin' a-hole. And this is coming from somebody who thinks you're a friggin' a-hole if you didn't put wings on the mask of Captain America. Anybody hears that and they're just like, wow, you are such a tool. They've made a Captain America movie. Isn't that enough for you? And for us, it's like, no, no, it's not enough. You let Loki wear the big horned helmet. Why can't you put the right kind of mask on Captain America? And, you know, if somebody made a movie about Noah and the Ark, and he spoke with a New Jersey accent, <laughs> and he smoked a big cigar, people would be outraged, and it's no different. This stuff is beloved. This stuff is the bedrock of the moral center of an entire generation, and generation before mine, and the generation after mine, and you disrespect it. That's disrespect to me. <laughs> Oh, I think you've just woken up my whole family with that tirade. <laughs> well, they need to be woken up. They your disrespected son, you for that. Your son needs to know that the X-Men wear costumes, by God. That's right. They wear them in the first dang book. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> and it's funny because I do recognize that it's absurd, the things that I'm saying. <laughs> But I, and I've ranted about it on the show before, uh, and I'll rant again. They expect us to believe that there's a woman who can control the weather and make lightning strike and all that. But we won't believe that they wear multicolored costumes. Well, they expect us to believe that there's a guy that you can shoot him and he heals instantly. Oh, but we can't believe that Magneto can fly. It's all make-believe. It's all absurd. It's all silly. The, the guy got the powers of a spider and he can climb on walls and he can have a sixth sense that tells him when danger is near, but we won't believe that he could invent some kind of webbing to help him get around. No, that's, that's too far. That's too silly. This is based in fact, <laughs> the absurdity of making a statement of saying, well, one thing is too far, that there could be aliens in the same universe as mutants. That's just crazy. <laughs> I apologize. We, at one point, were talking about the Invisible Kingdom. I think we were, yeah. Oh, okay. So, see, now, I'm not, I'm, I don't have a fantasy background, and I don't have really a science fiction background. I have comic books. Uh -huh. And in my mind, 
somebody comes to you and says that you are the next superhero to defend Earth from the invasion of Zerg and his bad forces, and you'd be like, what? what? No, I, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. And people are like, we need you. People start rallying and calling your name. That's, that's what I think of. Uh -huh. But what if the power never comes? What if you never right. suddenly have your mind cleared and go, oh, oh yes. yes. Generationally, this power has, has been, been mine, mine. And that and is that why I talk, I talk like, like this, this now. now. Well, suddenly, here come the armada of invading aliens, and you still don't have any powers. You still <laughs> don't know any super strategy or anything like that. And the president is like, what do we do now? <laughs> You're like, uh, uh, run? <laughs> is there a spaceship we can fly away in? I can't think of uh, something like that, you know, where the, the stuff never came. There's story after story after story where the person is the chosen one, mm -hmm. the wizard that's, uh, you know, the boy who lived or is uh, the dragon reborn or whatever it is. But yeah, it, it always comes to pass. These prophecies are always true. They never just have to go, well, crap, maybe I just better make do with what I've got. I remember... Not to go back to Harry Potter, because people are still shaking their fists over our Harry Potter episode, but wasn't Harry and the fat kid who became not fat born on the same day? Dudley? No. You mean uh, Neville, Neville Longbottom? Neville Longbottom. Weren't they born on the same day and under similar circumstances, and so that there was the prophecy of who would be the chosen one, and it could have applied to either of them. And at some point, Harry thinks, I had just one thing changed, Neville would be the one that, that would be expected to save yeah, us from the if forces If I remember right, I think it was, it could have been either one of them, and Voldemort just decided it must be Harry, and by deciding and going after Harry, it basically made him the chosen one instead of it being Neville. So, yeah, it's, that's an interesting uh, twist on that whole bit. But, you know, I bet uh, our listeners right now are probably just in here, oh yeah, well... Pff. You guys are totally missing what about this story where the guy was a chosen one and nothing ever happened and he had to do it all on his own. But that's what the comments are for. Let us know. Yeah, that would be cool to get some discussion on that or just talk about other stories where there's the chosen one and how it came to pass. It's a, such a common concept. I guess that's just part. Is that part of the hero's journey? Are you a hero's journey scholar? I'm familiar with Joseph Campbell a little bit in the hero's journey and I tried to read that book hero with a thousand faces mm -hmm. but it's never as cool as when people are talking about it in a class <laughs> yeah. and liking it to star yeah. wars star wars yeah, really when i say oh but there's the wise old man who is ah oh, ben kenobi see that look it falls right in there yeah it's much more interesting as not talking about like ulysses or something like that where you're just like ah oh, who and you know it's possible that in the 20 teens in college courses, people will be teaching using Harry Potter and the Harry Potter characters and stuff like that rather than Star Wars. I mean, Star Wars is kind of timeless, but it is also 30-something years old. There, there may be other things that are really popular right now that resonate stronger with kids. But uh, with me, all you have to do is just say one little thing. Was Anakin Skywalker the chosen one? And suddenly we start talking about it. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I don't have a connection with those prequels like I do with the originals. But, you know, I think Lucas was trying to make some kind of modern fairy tale or modern mythology because he felt like the kids of the late 60s and the early 70s were really cynical. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'd had a president turn out to be corrupt and they'd had an unjust war in Asia that we lost. Right. Things like that where it's just like, wow, we don't believe in anything anymore. And so he tried to create something that was similar to, I guess, what resonated to him as a boy growing up in the 40s. I don't know how old Lucas would have been. 40s or the 50s, it had to have been, I would say. Yeah, 50s probably better. Yeah. But it worked. It. I don't know if it's the Joseph Campbell thing. I don't know if it was the time when Star Wars came out or all of the talent that people put into making this movie or if it was just divine inspiration or something like that but it spoke to me as you know i just and and to every kid in my elementary school <laughs> right and, and that's how i still think of it today i tend not to think of the star wars trilogy as a 30 something adult but as a little boy that saw them or right it speaks to the boy that still resides within me mm-hmm 
geez, I'm sorry, Mark, to be talking about Star Wars and Harry Potter on your episode. <laughs> the truth is, your story was really short. And I don't know that it was meant to be dissected, you know, and say, well, this actually is symbolic for the, the passage into adulthood that every single young person, I mean, he, he mentioned in his author's note. So obviously that was forming the backbone for this story. And if you think the invisible kingdom is actually a um, euphemism for sex and nobody needs and that Freudian terms, the screen is actually a breast. <laughs> Everybody needs a bosom for a pillow. That's right. Everybody needs a bosom. You knew that song too. <laughs> it's funny because Corner Shop was only popular for, I think you could measure it in days. Yeah. And yet, uh, I just loved that line. Everybody <laughs> needs a bosom for a pillow. I like the second line. Everybody needs a bosom. <laughs> no. <laughs> and now it's time for, I press the button. There's uh, this joke where, this kid uh, is in first grade, and he has to do a presentation in front of the class of what did you do over Christmas vacation. Uh -huh. The boy gets up, and he said, we go on a trip to my... And, and the teacher said, hey, hey, oh, oh. we're just going to use grown-up words. We went on a trip. And he goes, okay, we went to a trip to see Grandpa and Nana. And he's like, uh, uh, uh grown-up words. We went to see Grandpa and Grandma, or Grandfather and Grandmother. Okay. And what did you do when you were at your grandparents' house? And he says, we went and saw a movie. And he says, like, what was the movie? And remember, use grown-up words. And the boy says, we saw Winnie the Shit. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'll be here all week, folks. That's good. Is this going to take that long to find one worth listening to? All right. Find one what? <laughs> one of your jokes. Oh, you monster. <laughs> they don't pay me to do this, you know. Oh, well, tip your waitresses then. Well, okay. If they did pay me uh -huh. to do it, maybe we would have a Christmas episode this year. <laughs> maybe that weren't for those pesky jobs. I mean, I'm right now I'm in between unemployments. So it's been really difficult <laughs> to have time to write or to edit or to podcast. And I know you've had difficulty your whole life with that. Apparently, you're <laughs> yeah. able to hold down a job. This time of uh, year is always the worst because, you know, it's the end of the year. So everyone, at least at my work, some places it carries over. But you got to get your vacation in before the year runs out. And so everybody, of course, has waited to the last minute. And so now they're putting any day that's got a vacancy. Oh, there's nobody taking vacation. Oh, can I have that one? You know, and so basically the last four weeks of the year have one, sometimes even two people off at once. And there's only like three of us all together. So it gets rough. The time to uh, do things is gone, unfortunately. And we did intend. Yeah, we always make big plans. And then yeah, I think what we were going to do this year was we we're going to write a story together, a, a horror yeah. story. Or was it going to be an audio drama or was it just going to be a story? I thought it was going to be a story, but I don't know. And I guess we started on it in, it was so recently, like February or something like that. <laughs> Never got any work done on it. And I thought, oh, shoot, that's too bad. And then you said something like, well, hey, do you have any stories that we can run of yours for Christmas? you have any Christmas stories, any holiday stories, any Kwanzaa adventures? And I guess I came up with one or it was just purely an accident that it happened to be about Christmas time. Yeah, you started writing a story about Christmas, but... That was, I believe, Boxing Day that you started writing it, so uh, kind of ran out of time. Yeah, I'm not good that way with the whole deadline thing. I'm one of those right, up, right past the last minute kind of writers. <laughs> so we don't have a Christmas episode this year. Yeah. But, but we started recording something last week that was supposed to be... Our Christmas show. No, it was actually supposed to be a special reward for folks who donate to our show. Oh, and okay. as we were reading the story, we went, this is kind of a Christmas story. I mean, it's not about Christmas, but it takes place during Christmas time. And it has some of those themes of like relatives being around and, and, and that kind of stuff. And we thought, you know, maybe we should do this as our Christmas episode after all, instead of having it be the special episode just for those who donate. We considered it, we thought about it, and then we had to do a lot of work and not a lot of editing and getting things ready for Christmas, and it didn't make it. But we're still putting it together, and we still plan on having it for those who donate. So if you miss the Christmas episode, 
and you'd like to hear a Rish Outfield story that's set in the Christmas spirit and is full of bodily functions. Yeah, very scatological. Then donate to the show and it will be yours as a special uh what do they call it on those telethon shows, those uh, the the beg for money things on the PBS channels? Oh, it's like we'll give you this yeah. ten dollar bag with PBS on it. If you donate a hundred dollars to us, yeah. like, wait, math wise. It's like a parting gift that you get from the game show when you're the loser that our other contestants will receive these wonderful parting gifts. It's, it's kind of like that. rice a yeah. the San Francisco tree, <laughs> and the home game of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction. <laughs> that's magazine. right. Yeah, there is a word. I would think of it as like a, an incentive, but that's not what they call it on a... The tele- Please yeah. give. <laughs> Sally Struthers show. I swear there must be something, but you know, I haven't watched enough of those Jerry Lewis telethons. or Whenever it's that freaking beg for money on PBS, you're changing away as fast as you can because it's more boring than watching the QVC channel or something. See, when I was a kid, there would only be one time of year when PBS would show anything worth watching, and it would be during the pledge drive when they trot out their best material, their stuff that they've been saving the whole year. They'd show the Anne of Green Gables uh, miniseries thing again, and then, of course, my sisters would record it at that point, and so I'd get to see, <laughs> you can get this and this. I'm seeing this three years later. If you donate, you get this, which they're giving you, a, I don't know, a Knight Rider lunch pail or something, and Knight Rider's been canceled for five years, and we're still seeing it. I guess they wouldn't do Knight Rider, would they? Not on PBS, huh? Masterpiece can- Theater lunch pail. <laughs> Nothing gets canceled on PBS. <laughs> they give you a Sesame Street lunch pail. And Sesame Street's been canceled for years. And wait a minute. I don't know what you call it. But we'll call it incentive. For a okay. Now, incentive. Abby Hilton over at Cowrie Catchers did a story that was related to her main story. Mm-hmm. And only people who paid for the story could hear it. Right. People were willing to pay... In droves, I guess. People just really either they eat, they wanted to repay her for the entertainment that she'd given them for free, or they just really, really wanted to hear this story. And to me, it was I know it's the holidays or whatever, but it just warmed my heart that so many people were willing to give her money, you know, to say, hey, thank you. Thank you for, oh. for entertaining me for all these weeks and months. And, you know, we really love your story and what you're writing. Here's a couple bucks. And, dude, the first time we ever got a donation... It wasn't even a real donation, but Michael Stone said, you don't have to pay me for the story. Right. I was just like blown away by that. It's like, oh, wow, we can eat this week. (laughs) (laughs) And the first time that somebody actually donated it, I think either that was the time that you talked me off the ledge or you actually just called and said, hey, somebody donated to the podcast. It felt good, man. It was really neat. Yeah. So you in no way need to donate to us. And if you're already a donator, thank you. I believe they call them donors. Isn't a donor a person that, you know, gives their kidney to that too. somebody against their will in <laughs> Bangkok motel room? I don't think that's quite the definition. You know what? We're not going to have a dollar amount. You know, like you have to donate $20, you have to donate $15, right? Right. We're just going to have, you have to donate $5 a month. Oh, wait, sorry. We're not going to do that. <laughs> Well, no, maybe we should talk about this because no, if somebody to. friggin' wanted to donate eight cents, we would have to eat the 40 cent <laughs> PayPal fee, Nobody's right? going to donate eight cents. There's no dollar amount. We just want a lot of dollars. Wait, sorry. Um, no dollar amount. You donate what you want. Pounds are fine. Yes. It doesn't have to be dollars. <laughs> it could be dollars, too. Uh, marks. We, Pesos. We do say take marks. You can donate whatever amount you want. Please don't donate like eight cents because that will actually cost us money because PayPal will charge a minimum of what, like 50 cents or something for every... Jeez. Oh, so don't do if, that. If somebody did that, instead of the bonus episode, instead of the... Uh, what are we calling Incentive? It? Incentive episode. We'll send them like our seven minute belch reel. <laughs> Dude, you may well get people to do it just for that. So. We'll send them the fart reel. <laughs> just all the times you farted in the middle of a story reading. <laughs> yeah, please don't screw us over. We'll... You won't get the story if you do that. Just know that now. We can just <laughs> refund it and 
and get our feedback, right? That's right. And so should this just be for the month of January then? Should we think – or until mid-February, something well, like that? Well, I think we probably ought to just leave it open-ended because if people are like me at all, sometimes you come to a podcast and you listen to like the most recent episode and you're like, hey, I think I like this podcast. This this People could be listening to this show for the first time in like 2013 or 14 or something because they just came to the podcast – and then they started listening backwards. But big, there won't be any internet after the world ends in 2012. Oh, okay. So maybe people just came to it the like end of visitors from another world. Or perhaps, yeah, perhaps here, that's Sifting it. through the ruins or like... We are able to listen to that technology. Even <laughs> 500 years ago. Oh, and look at this. We get three bonus episodes. <laughs> if we only donate. Wait, only, only for a month, month of January. January. I wanted to hear Richard's catalogical story. <laughs> Who knows what the heck is going to be going on well, I'll, after I'll the world what. has ended in 2013. I'll tell you what. We'll do this for a little while. And then sometime when, we, when I'm out of work and we have extra time on my hands, we'll record a story of yours and we'll do an episode about it. You can talk about where that story came from and we'll riff there you and go. try to be funny and offend people. And then we'll, we'll offer make... that as an incentive for right. people then. So when you donate, if especially if you're doing it in 2013 or 14 or 15 or whatever, be sure to mention which story that you want as your incentive episode. This one's called Home Runs, by the way. Is it really? God, what a terrible <laughs> title. Well, Did you name this one? No, the guy who named it is not very good at titles, it turns out. I hate out. people that do puns in their titles. Seriously, what is the title of this story? Home Runs. But it's not even remotely related to baseball, is it? No. Oh, douche. Douche. And then, and then we're going to have a ROA to T write a story, I suppose. Announcer oh. Man is actually already working. He's, he's doing 25 stories in 52 weeks, it turns out. We have to do it. I guess he was serious about it. Huh. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, our little promo. If you feel like donating, if you're wanting to donate and you needed something in return, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, you can check it oh, out. Let them know how they donate. Uh, the donate the, uh, the, uh, in English, please. On the uh, website uh, www. there is a button, a couple of buttons actually, along the uh, right side that are for uh, donating. You just click on it. There's several options. There's the donate once, where you can just pick your amount, not eight cents. There is the donate uh, five bucks a month, five bucks a quarter. So you can check out all those that you can donate. Okay, and what do they get to say if they click on that <laughs> link? Uh, you know, I don't have that uh, sounder anymore. I pressed the button. It's How long has it's it been? It's been a long time. Folks. Yeah, it's been a long time since I rock and rolled. Thank you for listening and for those that you, of you that donate. Thank you yes, thank for helping you so us much. keep the show on the air or, or on the potosphere. I, uh, can, can I please say on the air? No. Announcer man. You're not in charge. What the hell? See you guys later. I'm going for a smoke break. All right. Take care. Yeah, I guess that's what you usually do. And now on with the countdown. <laughs> Should we bring out the dueling? No, I think I got too many complaints about how crappy my impression was. So. No, they didn't like your Wolfman Jack. Well, who could? I did. I thought it was great. <laughs> No one could listen through that. I play that sometimes to get my woman in the mood. She's like, is that big? I could listen to him all night. <laughs> and it's much better with uh, you in the background. I think she's able to more simply imagine sleeping with you. <sighs> <sighs> all right. So thanks, folks. Well, hey, I apologize that we've been gone for so long. We're going to try in 2011 to have things a little bit more consistent. And thanks to Clay, I think we made our deadline on this one. Yeah. So if you would like to do what he did, cast up the story, edit it all together, put in sound effects and music, then just let us know uh, over at uh, editor at dunesteef.com. Let us know that you'd like to be a producer and like to help out in some way. Thanks a lot, Clay, for doing that. We'll have another story sending your way soon. Get ready to uh, do this again because everyone needs a bosom for a pillow. Everyone? Everyone needs a bosom. <laughs> well, hey, on that note, I've been Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Thanks for listening, folks. Good night. We are
Thank you for listening to the Doonstief. I think I hear your mama calling you, Rish. The Doonstief is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. You can do it, Rudy. Take two. <laughs> you want me to? I almost don't. Are you sure? This is your thing. You're the director, man. Well, you want me to do it in some kind of a accent? Barbie, Captain Barbie, for years, Barbie doll abandoned <laughs> us in the middle of a leaky toy box. <laughs> I'm Mario. <laughs> Tender lumplings everywhere. Life's no fun without a good scare. You've probably listened to our outtakes before, so if you find Only s- Wendy has listened to the outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so no accent? No. Both the main character... Actually, do a, do a Ozark accent, please. I want you to do a particularly perfect Ozark accent. The Invisible Kingdom. No, no. Um, you just did a generic Southeastern pastiche. Dang. If you can't... Oh, if no respect at all for us people that live in northern Arkansas slash southern Missouri. <laughs> so, so you're saying that if I can't do a totally accurate accent from your region, I should do no accent at all. Right. But make sure you don't do an accent that's from your region either. It has to be a, a generic American. <laughs> Sorry, we're wasting a lot of Clay's time. Go ahead. And our own. That's true. We do with that anyways, though. When will you take up the unseen crown and the loosened blade? (coughs) Wow. (coughs) Takes a lot out of you, apparently. Apparently so. The end. Can you make this text bigger? bigger? No. Way. Page. Let's make it nice and wide. See, length is usually really important, but girth. Also. Girth is. <gasps> Shazam! I think 28 is a little big. You think so? You said you wanted it bigger. Well, Never heard anyone say that's too big. You've not been to camp, apparently. <laughs> Wait. That, that, that time it didn't quite work, did it? Bearer of the loosened blade, magister of the verdant... F- magister of the verdant flame. I wish you could see, Clay, the hand gestures and the look on this guy's face right now. He's really getting into it. For the worst actor I ever knew in college, <laughs> this guy is so into it right now. <clears throat> I'm a little aroused. That's how good his Whoa. performance is. Hold on here. During... What? Might have to pause this and start again later because I don't know that I can be in the same room as Rish when he gets aroused at my performance. (laughs) (laughs) So only person who's ever been aroused at his performance, if you know what I mean. (laughs) Oh, that's enough. I'm an ordinary guy. I have an ordinary life. I work at the Barnes and Noble. I like Asian food and Asian boys and books and... (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry. My life doesn't just turn itself upside down like this for no good reason. Was I ever wrong? No, you weren't. Next question. Put down his pen in the newspaper. He had been playing Sudoku. Sudoku! Thank you. My name is Totoro! Oh. <laughs> right, we're, so, we're on the same wavelength. We might both sleep with his wife tonight. Uh, Put down his pen and the newspaper. More likely it'll be neither of us. <laughs> Sorry, yes. I, he's, he's so close to me that that's what's going to happen rather than the opposite. You know, Master, if I may be so bold as to advise one such as yourself, the damn static has come. No! You know, Master, if I may be so bold as to advise uh, one such as yourself, let me try that again, just in case Steve Ely gives us the finger again. Again. You know, (laughs) Master. Sorry. I I stepped on your line. (laughs) 
Okay, do it in Eric Idle's voice. Just all of that. In the, <laughs> the, you, know, the... you know, Master, if I may be so bold as to advise one such as yourself, make the unseen scene. Hey, hey. She does go, yes. Oh, say no more. <laughs> Return and triumph to the Invisible Kingdom, and so on. Any of this ringing a bell? Sorry. <laughs> I wonder if Clay likes it when we record our farts. Uh, what about our burps? Um, I'm going to say no on the burps, but yes on the... No, other way. Oh, uh, I want to change my I, answer. I don't like it when you record your fart, because that means I'm smelling your fart now. Okay, okay. There was a tall, skinny teenager working the counter at Quiznos who gave me my sandwich for free, saying, Anything for the uncrowned king? You... Do... What? Should I do that in a different voice? <clears throat> <laughs> hey, you're ruining his focus. Shut up, man. Just open the gates before my bitch of a landlord raises my rent on me again. I think he's going to cast somebody <clears throat> else for that one, I'm I, afraid. I hope so. <laughs> Welcome to Quiznos. How can I help you, Your Majesty? You're ruining his focus, man. <laughs> you're going to ruin his focus. <laughs> focus, man. Spock. Oh, Spock. Sorry. That was for you, Rish. It's live, Jim, but not as we know it. Not as we know it, Captain. There's Klingons on the starboard bow. Starboard bow, starboard bow. <laughs> Just open the gates before my bitch of a landlord raises my rent on me again. Okay, now you've flubbed that mer- yeah. mer- 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 ran it on me again. But it's me, me. Don't do it between you and me. No, I can't. No, dick the heck. Cut that out. All right, OT, can you cut this part out? That was for the beepers. Anything. Stop it. Okay. Gates, before the bitch of my landlord raises my bitch. Okay, don't rearrange the words. Okay, the sentence is in that order on purpose. One woman started hitting on me at the local cafe. One woman started hitting on me at the local cafe, but it turned out that she was just... Aching for the touch of the master, the one true lord of the unnamed star, if it would not be too presumptuous to beg for such attention. Well, I, I, I suppose I, I could. I, I, I'm not in really a hurry. I could be a little late. What's that you said about going upstairs? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Um. <laughs> no, I don't want you to leave <laughs> me alone with this woman. <laughs> Because I'm not going to be locked in a closet with a seven-year-old girl. Right, right. <laughs> with recording equipment. Or reacting to him or anything. I'm just off in my own little world. So I have a little freedom to adulate. To adulate? I adulate this story really well. <laughs> I'm pursuit. I'm pursuiting it really good, too. Turn it on. Okay, so I can be... Well, I wasn't really sure of the character no. itself. Turn it so the She's character trying is to get slut. laid. <laughs> There will be a blooper reel. Ooh, bye. Warp factor nine, Mr. Sulu. The planet of unwed boys. (laughs) Ooh, bye. If I had cookies and you wanted a cookie, how would you ask me? Could I please have a cookie? That's how I want you to do it. But without the cookie and the please and the could I have a... (laughs) So So just like that, but totally different. (laughs) <laughs> I want, I wanted that. Okay. Now, all right. Look at me. <laughs> when are you going? To, when are you going? When are you going? Going. Going. <laughs> okay, we're not helping. <laughs> You need to shut up, and so do I, for that matter. <laughs> Stop touching that. <laughs> that was for the blooper reel. Okay. Now, come on. Haley, if you turn around, you'll, you'll get a piece of candy. Okay. So, now, Rish and Big, y'all owe me Big for this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Rish, big. You I'm going, are going big time. Going, I'm going to kill you. 
for making me do this. <laughs> oh, wait, that's right. I volunteered. <laughs> but they gave yeah, me... Ha, 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 I'm laughing at that. <laughs> but they gave me a story with a child in it. The Invisible Kingdom's misery is on your head. You're the one whose static is going over your lines. She had a strange look in her eyes. I think something was wrong with her. Do you Oops, get the on. impression she might have owned a cat? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, then, yes, maybe, definitely something was wrong. Maybe several. Probably like five cats. Pretty much everything I owned. CDs, books, my laptop was in a pile in front of him. Covered in urine. Phew! He scrambled through the door, then turned in the hallway to look at me one last time. Uh. What was that? Ah, <laughs> yikes. When she suddenly turned to me and said, You know, Ben, I've been thinking. A dangerous pastime? I know. I felt my heart beat a little faster. I felt my heart beat a little faster. I like that first take where it was all Shatnery. Shatnerian, is that the correct term? I felt my heart beat a little faster. She, time? Time for what? She touched the side of my face and turned my head so I could look into her eyes. I felt my heart beat a... F <laughs> now I, I, I hear it in my mind. It's time to go home. Bum, 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 bum,